So it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the leader of Her His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Right now in Ontario, people are being asked to pull out their credit cards to pay for health care. The Auditor General has found that for-profit clinics are pressuring people to shell out thousands of dollars for OHIP-covered services. Why does the Premier think it's okay to force people to pull out their credit cards to access health care in this province? Reply, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we've been very clear on this side of the House. While we embrace innovation, while we want to see those exciting opportunities that will ensure our surgery backlogs and our individuals have access to critical health care in their community, uh, we're doing that. We have also been very clear that it will continue to be an OHIP funded system in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, she can tell that to the people who shell out hundreds of dollars for extra for cataract lenses in this province. Last week, this government had a chance to crack down on predatory fees in health care. Instead, this government voted down an NDP bill to stop for-profit clinics from charging for services people should be able to cover with OHIP. Is the Premier refusing to crack down on these predatory fees because it would foil his plans to privatize our health care system? Mr. Health. Speaker, with the greatest of respect, if the member opposite has examples, then name them. Yeah. We have a process Amen. in the Ministry of Health that ensures if an individual believes they were, for any number of reasons, improperly billed, we do the investigation, we follow up, and in some cases, in some limited cases, we have gone back and, and refunded. It is very, very unusual, but we do have a process to make sure that if a person believes they were unfairly uh, charged, there is an investigation and a follow-up. Name. Well, supplementary. Well, I'd suggest you read the Auditor General's report on this, because the Auditor General has found that, in fact, her words do not correspond with the actions that's happening here in Ontario. Not only is this government refusing to crack down on upselling and additional fees in health care, the government wants even more surgeries to be going to private for-profit clinics. Why is the Premier opening the door to much bigger bills for patients and much longer wait times in pain for everyone else? Mr. Health. Speaker, I'm going to highlight a, a, a recent example I had in Ottawa on Friday with um, Minister Fullerton and uh, MPP Goldie Gamara, where we talked about and we showed an innovation that is happening in the Champlain region, where individuals who are waiting for surgeries can have that surgery in a, in a host of, of hospitals in that community. Why? Because we see when we're matching surgeries and patients and, and hospitals, we get those surgeries done faster. That's the type of innovation that our government is investing in, and that will continue in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This government has taken a hatchet to farmland over the past few weeks, removing thousands of acres from the Greenbelt and destroying existing urban boundaries. Frankly, it is no surprise to find out that these changes will benefit powerful landowners like Silvio de Gasparis and Michael Rice, who have donor and political ties to the Ontario PC party. Given how suspicious this looks, Mr. Speaker, the least the government can do is be transparent about what has been happening behind closed doors. So I ask the Premier, how did the government choose which lands were going to be removed from the Green Belt? Speaker, the member opposite knows that the consultation that the government is engaged on is welcoming comments from the public. We made it very clear we were open, transparent, and honest with Ontarians when we indicated Order. that uh, at the end of the day, there would be over 2,000 acres added to the Greenbelt. The Greenbelt would be grown after this pr procedure, but at the same time, the criteria for the land that's part of that posting is very specific. It's got to be adjacent 
uh, to an already urbanized area. It has to have servicing uh, either on that property or very, very close to it. Order. The fact is we're in the middle of a housing crisis and that we have the opportunity to, at the end of the day, grow the green belt, but at the same time have a minimum of 50,000 new housing starts. It's a good day for Ontario yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. That kind of answer isn't going to fly for Ontarians. One of these Greenbelt properties was purchased only two months ago by Conservative donor Michael Rice. At the time of the purchase, the lands were protected Greenbelt and, at least financially, worth little. But now that they'll be open for development, Mr. Rice stands to make millions. It's all a bit curious, Mr. Speaker, so I'll give the government another chance to set the record straight. Prior to the public announcement of changes to the Greenbelt, did the Premier or the Minister or any of their current or former staff share any information about changes to the Greenbelt with owners and developers that was not already available to the public? Speaker, we made our intentions very clear with that posting. Uh, the, the information that is available for Ontarians is exactly what's on the Environmental Registry of Ontario today. You know, Speaker, again, this person, this party, this, the opposition uh, have uh, you know, a particular bent against building homes. They continuously talk about the fact that they acknowledge we need to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years, but every time, every time uh, we'll, we're going to see it today, uh, after question period, when, when the time for them to stand in their place and, and look the next generation of Ontarians in the eye and say that we've got your back and that we're going to be building for you so you can realize the dream Order. of ownership. Every single solitary time, they vote against it. So I yeah. think you know, it's, a, it's pretty rich coming from that, that party opposite, the New Democratic Party, to be talking about you know, Order. Final Speaker, there is not a shred of evidence that this is going to build a single affordable home. But there's plenty of evidence, plenty of evidence to suggest that these wealthy PC donors made a very careful bet against our green belt, despite the Premier's promises never to touch it. I have written to the Auditor General to ask for an investigation, but the government could clear the air right now. Will the minister and the Premier launch an independent investigation into suspicious sales of Greenbelt lands and make the findings public. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, you know, I've said in this House, um, you know, there are properties that are part of that posting that local mayors have, have asked uh, be developed. The, the one property in particular in Pickering has been the subject of discussion since the early 2000s. The property uh, that the member talked about uh, you know, in York Region, uh, at the end of the day, uh, will be an opportunity to build the new South Lake Hospital, something that uh, the local council member wrote to me on. Over and over and over again, there is a chorus Order. of voices, not New Democrats, Order. Granted, that, that actually want to get shovels in the ground and build homes so that new Canadians who are coming to our wonderful province, the best Order. place to live, to work, and to raise a family, I want to make sure we've got housing for them. Need it. I'll ask the House to come to order so that I can hear the member who has the floor or the minister who has the floor. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Good morning, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, um, First Nations across Ontario have stated their opposition to Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act, due to the clear violation of First Nations constitutionally protected inherent and treaty rights. Chiefs of Ontario, representing 134 First Nations in Ontario, have said First Nations are not stakeholders. We are sovereign nations and are entitled to proper consultation. Speaker, it's uh, 2022. It is very colonial for Ontario to abuse their power by making these bills without consultation or engagement with First Nations. Are you going to question? Are you going to uh, consult First Nations 
affected by this bill. I ask the members to make their comments through the chair. To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And Thanks very much. Our, our government knows how important it is uh, to work with our Indigenous leaders to create opportunities for them and meet our obligations uh, to them on our shared priorities. We're committed as a government to meeting the province's constitutional and other obligations, uh, as outlined by the member, and our government is committed to honouring the principles of truth and reconciliation and focus on Indigenous priorities, um, specifically sharing uh, our prosperity with them. Uh, we continue to work with, uh, with all Ontarians, and I appreciate the question from the honourable member. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, this government cannot continue to say our First Nations. You do not own us. <laughs> Speaker, uh, people from uh, across Ontario have contacted my, contacted my office because they oppose Bill 23. Municipalities are speaking out against Bill 23. And now all the First Nations across the province have said they don't want this bill. Speaker, that is a lot of people to listen to. Will this government start listening to people who are protecting the lands and the waters instead of their developer friends? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous. Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the honourable member's question. Look, we have an opportunity here, Mr. Speaker, and that is to build more houses for more families. And we've heard it from more than just municipalities, frankly. We've heard it from Indigenous communities. They see an opportunity to invest in real estate properties, Mr. Speaker. They see an opportunity to create better and more homes in their own communities, Mr. Speaker. This pan-provincial pl uh, plan that we have to build more homes for, is for all of Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. We continue to honour the duty to, cons uh, to consult, Mr. Speaker. There's no question about that. We began in earnest on this bill, and we will not back down from the opportunity, the shared opportunity between Indigenous communities, municipalities, and for the greater good of this province, Mr. Speaker, to build more homes for more families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and listen, ongoing supply chain disruptions continue to adversely affect the global economy, and this geopolitical instability has only reinforced the importance that our government should place on ensuring the security of our critical minerals and natural resources. Northern Ontario can be a worldwide supplier of critical minerals such as nickel, cobalt, and lithium, all essential minerals required to construct new electric and green technology. So, Speaker, can the Minister of Mines please expand on our government's most recent announcement about the new investments in the critical mineral sector? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Mines. Thank you to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for the question. Mr. Speaker, last week I was in Timmins to launch the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund. This is a very exciting time for Ontario as we decarbonize our economy. What we're doing is critical to the future of not only Ontario, but to the globe. This is a two-year, $5 million fund, $5 million fund which will, su will support research, development and commercialization of innovative technologies, techniques, processes, analytical solutions for critical minerals. These projects will help increase exploration, mining development, production, and processing capacity of critical minerals in Ontario. Our investment will leverage Ontario's expertise to tap into new and growing markets and to ensure we capitalize on demand for Response. critical minerals. Supplementary question. To, uh, thank you again, Speaker, and, and thank you to the Minister for his response and explanation of this very worthwhile program. Uh, the criti critical mineral and mining sector continues to demonstrate a solid commitment to advancing economic growth and opportunities in the North. Unfortunately, for far too long under previous governments, and might I add, previous Liberal governments, Mr. Speaker, this sector did not receive the respect and support it deserves, and as someone who grew up in North Bay, I've seen it firsthand. This is why our government must show leadership by partnering in good faith with companies that are at the forefront of critical mineral innovation. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how the mining and business community has responded to our government's new critical innovation fund? Minister of Mines. Thank you again for the question. 
Mr. Speaker, you don't have to take our word for it. Just listen to the CEO of Canada Nickel, Mark Selby, had to say. The funding announced today by the Ontario government is an important signal of its support for Ontario's mining and downstream processing industries. They get it, sir. They get it. Mr. Speaker, I know there are industries, there are industries that will leverage this fund to partner with Indigenous communities, non nonprofits, colleges, academics, to ensure Ontario remains a leader in innovation in the mining sector. This will strengthen our critical mineral strategy and help us achieve our goal by creating a supply chain for clean technologies right here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last week, I told the Minister about the unacceptable conditions for children and youth in the child welfare system. I told her about how kids in for-profit group home, hats off, are being over-medicated chemically restrained, how kids are regularly being prescribed psychotropic medication after only five to ten minute long doctor appointments, medication that sometimes made them feel, I quote, heavily suicidal or, quote, like zombies. I told her about how vulnerable kids receive punitive punishments. I asked her to investigate these serious allegations of neglect and mistreatment. She dodged the question. Speaker, I'll ask again. Will the minister acknowledge how bad the system is for kids in their care and commit to a full investigation into hats off? There you go. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. As the member opposite would have heard me say numerous times in, in the last week, uh, there is no room in our system for providers who are not in compliance with the requirements that are set out. I have said this repeatedly. And, and the time for more reports is over. It's our government that's taking action on this. This is a child welfare redesign that has uh, discussed and consulted across the sector. It is about improving the inspections. We've increased the number of inspectors. We've increased the number of, uh, uh, of the unannounced uh, inspections. We've, we've addressed the medication, the chemical restraints. And, and again, the consent for medical treatment, including youth in care, is enshrined in law. And that means it, it, it's, it's not achieved through coercion. It means that the, the homes have to abide by the law, and that's why we have the inspections. Response? It's why we have improved accountability. It's why we've improved oversight. It's why we're doing this after decades of neglect by the previous government supported by the NDP. A supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the one concrete action that this minister could take today is to launch an investigation into hats off. Yeah. Speaker, the problems aren't limited to hats off. It's an issue across the entire for-profit group home system. For-profit homes make up a quarter of all operators, over half of all serious occurrence reports, and 83% of all instances of the use of physical restraints. Companies looking to make a profit off of vulnerable children have no place in our province's child welfare system. The minister keeps touting the government's welfare redesign. So, Speaker, I'll ask the minister this question right now. It's a yes or no answer. Will the minister commit to abolishing the for-profit child welfare system model and putting the care of children above corporate profit? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services to apply. Thank you, Speaker. I think the biggest question is uh, why the, the member opposite and her, uh, her party and her group did nothing and sat on this for yeah, decades. Our, our government is order. taking action. We, we want every child and youth to have a safe and loving home. And that's why we're redesigning order. the child welfare system. That's why we've boosted the number of inspections at licensed group homes since January 2022. It's why we've added 20 new staff to support enhanced inspections of the children's residential service. It's why we released the children order. and young persons' rights resource, a, a youth-friendly language to help children, youth, and young persons understand their rights and use their voices. And we've backed up this important work with significant investments. Our government is fixing a long-standing <coughs> issue that the previous government, supported by the NDP, never bothered to. Order. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development. With continuing global economic challenges, concerns amiss, uh, persist among our tourism op operators, especially those in the north. Last week, the Ontario Northern Ontario Tourism Summit took place in my home of Thunder Bay. 
This critical summit was an opportunity for tourism operators to gather together, strategize and examine ways to address ongoing economic challenges. Speaker, can the Minister of Northern Development please elaborate further about what our government and this, his ministry in particular are doing to help support this sector as they move forward? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member and my neighbour uh, for that important question. In my welcoming remarks, Mr. Speaker, at the Northern Ontario Tourist Summit, there was a palpable excitement around the idea not only that we could be uh, live at the forum, but that we could share and celebrate in the incredible opportunities em emerging from a post-COVID world. No doubt that the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund was there for the Northern Ontario Recovery Program, Mr. Speaker, but we used words like planning, renovating, enhancing, repairing, refurbishing, reopening, Mr. Speaker, an expanded partnership with Indigenous Tourism Ontario, Mr. Speaker, a commitment to tourist operators, Mr. Speaker, that at every step of the way in a post-COVID world, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, the Ministry of Northern Development, and this government would stand with tourist operators in Northern Ontario, Mr. Right. Speaker. Supplementary question? Member for Senate. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his response. It's encouraging to hear about our government's commitment to supporting the North and its tourism sector. Because of our government's investments, businesses will be able to expand their operations, create jobs, and contribute to our economic prosperity, helping to attract more visitors. While these investments in the summit meeting are vital for Northern Ontario's economic success, we must ensure that our government continues to advocate for this sector and region year-round. Speaker, what further actions are our government taking to support economic development for communities across the north? Thank you. To Northern Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I announced $4.9 million in the latest tranche, uh, focused squarely uh, on communities across our vast 800,000 square kilometer region known as Northern Ontario. We're drawing up plans, Mr. Speaker, for an event centre in Red Lake. Uh, we're planning uh, with Garden uh, River First Nation, Mr. Speaker, to connect the Ojibwe Park Trails to the Trans-Canada Trails, Mr. Speaker. We want to reopen Silver Islet General Store for retail, food, and educational tourist destinations. Kapiskasing's Golf and Recreation Club, Mr. Speaker, is going to be uh, revamped. We're going to support the town of northeastern Manitoulin and the islands in refurbishing the recreation centre. The Blind River Curling Club, Mr. Speaker, is going to get a new roof. These are all small Response. in some respects, but very important announcements for those communities as they open their doors back up, Mr. Speaker, to all the people who want to come and celebrate what we already know is great about Northern Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We understand the urgency of getting affordable housing built in Ontario. Families are struggling to pay their rent and find an affordable home. However, folks in Niagara and across this province are perplexed by this government's move to address this crisis by allowing the Premier to handpick and install regional chairs whenever he pleases to do his bidding. In Niagara, Regional Councillor Wayne Redekop recently said, this is the second election in a row that this government has interfered with the election of the chair. In 2018, they revoked the right of the residents of Niagara to elect the chair directly. Now in 2022, they are revoking the right of the elected representatives of the residents to select the chair. <laughs> Speaker, why won't this government work collaboratively with Ontario's elected municipal officials to address the affordable housing crisis and stop this ham-fisted and insulting power grab? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, that's exactly why we want uh, to have some consistency uh, and work with a, a great chair like Jim Bradley, Jim Bradley in Niagara to ensure that the extension of strong mayor powers uh, is smoothly uh, done at, at the regional level, and as well that we ensure that all of those uh, regional governments that we'll be dealing with have the opportunity to meet our provincial priorities and get shovels in the ground. At the end of the day, this is all about building 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years, and to have uh, that consistency at the regional level while we're working through uh, the strong mayor powers is so very important. Again, Speaker, it's, it's a bit rich from this member who served municipally 
uh, to be calling into question our motive in ensuring that Jim Bradley works with us. Jim Bradley, good shame number. on you. Good chair. The supplementary. Speaker, over the past week, I've had the opportunity to speak with a number of Toronto City Councillors who are outraged by this government's move to give mayors the power of minority rule. In a democracy, a mayor, a premier, a prime minister or a president must earn the votes of a majority of legislators to pass laws in the name of the citizens who democratically elected them. But no longer in Toronto. Now the premier and the mayor can pass laws that serve their own agenda from behind closed doors with just eight in favour and 17 opposed. Churchill once said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. Why does the premier and John Tory prefer the other ones? Well, you know, three words, uh, stability, continuity and efficiency. We're working to uh, look at all of those areas uh, at the regional level. That's why we've e extended uh, the strong mayor um, concept to those six regions in Bill 39. But at the end of the day, uh, Speaker, uh, what we're doing in Toronto and Ottawa, I've said uh, earlier this summer with our, our very first bill, one third of the projected growth in Ontario over the next 10 years will take place in our two largest cities of Toronto and Ottawa. We need to ensure that we give those mayors the tools that they need to be able to ensure that our provincial priorities are met. We've had great conversations with Mayor Tory. Uh, unlike the, the NDP, we support uh, our great mayor here in the city of Toronto. Order. We want to work with him and we're glad Response. that he wants to help meet those provincial priorities for building more housing. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Health. On behalf, on behalf of all of the patients in Ontario who currently face the worst healthcare system performance in this province's history, patients are tired of empty words. They're tired of hearing about inadequate preparation uh, for this respiratory season. We've heard this government crow about restarting the CPSO's practice ready assessment program the same program they cancelled in 2018. We've seen them pat each other on the back for asking hospitals to make surge plans, the same surge plans all hospitals make every year, whether a minister asks them to or not. We've heard them celebrate being in a position so dire that they have to ask sick kids staff to train nurses in community hospitals outside of their scope of practice. And we've heard them claim they're keeping students in school even though tens of thousands of them miss class every day because of respiratory illnesses. All the while, ER, t ER wait times get worse and worse. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Health admit that this crisis has slipped out of the government's hands and instead present a real plan? Minister of Health. You know, I am proud to talk about the innovation and the changes that we have made because, bluntly, our health care system was not looked after during the previous uh, administration. Fifteen years of ignoring Auditor General reports talking about a lack of uh, family physicians that will be needed in Northern Ontario. What did we do? We have initiated two new medical schools in the province of Ontario. Historic <laughs> investments in health care. The, the, the member opposite has a lot of audacity when his party was the one that cut residencies in the province of Ontario. Order. What has our government done? We've increased those positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've made sure that there are opportunities for people who want to practice medicine in the Spons? province of Ontario to have those opportunities. We will continue to do that, and we will proudly communicate those messages. Right. question. Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to thank the member from Brampton North for his enthusiasm for my question. Next, I'd like to ask the minister. I'd like to just uh, remark. I'd like to remark to the Minister of Health that, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The speaker standing because I can't hear the member for Don Valley East who has the floor because a number of members are interrupting him. And he, he rightly has the floor. Come to order. 
restart the clock. Member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to point out and thank the Minister of Health for, for uh, reminding us that, as far as I'm concerned, this government was elected in 2018, and they are the previous government. Um, and that, and I'm sorry, that's that's not that's not order, order. That's not that's not something to be proud of. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, I'm still struggling to understand. I'm still struggling to understand how this government continues to cherry pick their order. stats to defend the state of our health care system. They brag about starting two new medical schools, even though even though they haven't moved beyond the planning the planning stages for either. Why should, we, why should we believe they can deliver on those when they can't even deliver on license plates? They also talk about their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health to reply. <laughs> I will proudly put the investments in our record in the last four and a half years against the 15 years of inaction that happened <laughs> to suggest that we have not Order. made those investments Order. does not speak to what we are seeing on the ground. Over 50 different capital investments in our health care systems, whether it is new hospitals, whether it is expansions, whether it is badly needed renovations. Why, Speaker? Because the previous government didn't get it done. Our government is doing that. Thank you. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. The next question, the member for Mississauga-Streetsville. Thank you. Good morning. Speaker, experts predict that Ontario's population is expected to increase by 30 per cent over the next two decades. With this growing population, our infrastructure must grow with it. Modernizing our public infrastructure and building a seamless transportation network will help Ontario meet our current and future demands and will help strengthen the economy. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP, people of my riding endured years of delay and neglect when it came to building essential projects. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure please update the House on our government's progress in addressing our infrastructure needs? Thank you. Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, our government's capital plan is one of the most ambitious in the province's history. We're building Ontario like never before. We've dedicated over $159 billion in the next 10 years to support priority projects such as transit, highways, schools, hospitals, and long-term care. In fact, this quarter's listing includes 39 projects in active procurement and pre-procurement. By building these projects, we will finally build a subway system that will help residents travel across the city more easily and affordably. By building more highways, we will help ease congestion and help with the delivery of goods and address capacity challenges faced by our health care and long-term care sectors. As the member mentioned, the people of Ontario gave our government a strong mandate to build Ontario, and that is exactly what we will do. Thank you. Supplementary question. Once again, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Her, and thank you to the minister for that answer. It's great to see how our government is taking decisive action by building the critical infrastructure needed for our communities. When building for today and the future, we can't allow the mistakes made by the previous Liberal government to impact us as we move forward. Under the previous Liberal government, they delayed, neglected and closed critical infrastructure when we needed investments to be made. Speaker, can the Minister please share with the House what our government is doing to deliver effective and resilient infrastructure for all Ontarians? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, building Ontario means ensuring we are laying the foundation for a stronger and more productive Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we're, we're building a hospital in Brampton thanks to the hard work here, from here. the members of the Brampton West and Brampton South. We have shovels in the ground when it comes to building transit in the city, something which the previous governments failed to do. 
We are opening new and improved schools, unlike the Liberal government, which was busy closing schools Six across the province. We are connecting every single community to high-speed internet by the end of 2025, and we are building long-term care homes at a rapid pace, completing construction in the Durham long-term care home it w within 13 months, Mr. Speaker, as opposed to eight years. Wow. Mr. Speaker, we are building faster, smarter, and better because the people of this great province are depending on us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, during question period, the Parliamentary Assistant for Health said that she was tired of listening to people trying to instill fear in the population by using words and expressions like the worst crisis in generations. I'm wondering, Speaker, if she's including healthcare workers like Pam. Pam is a CUPE nurse at Oshawa Emergency. Pam said that this is the worst crisis in generations. Pam's been a nurse for over 36 years, and she told me she can't do this anymore. She said, this is the worst I've ever seen it. I don't know why we're still here. I guess it's because we love the people who need us. It's certainly not because of how the government treats us. My question, Speaker, is why does the Conservative government think they know better than healthcare workers like Pam? Minister of Health. Speaker, you know, from the very beginning, we have seen incredible resilience and commitment in our health care system, particularly with our nurses, personal support workers, and all of the individuals who really stepped up with, during the pandemic. First, of course, when we didn't have vaccines, and then ultimately uh, really assisting in the vaccine rollout, whether those were community paramedics working, uh, going directly into buildings and talking to residents to explain to them the benefits. There is no doubt that our health care workers in the province of Ontario have gone above and beyond in the last three years, which is why our government will continue to go above and beyond to make sure they have the appropriate workforce, the appropriate workplaces, safe workplaces to Response. continue to do this important work. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. I hope I get an answer from the Premier. Uh, Nelson is a CUPE building operator at Oak Hill Hospital, Speaker. He told me that Health and Hospital had people waiting and emerged for 12 and a half hours because they had no nurses at all. They called Oakville for assistance, but Oakville couldn't help. They had 50 people lined up for their emergency, and they only had one triage nurse. Nelson said in the past two years, 30 people have quit. Nobody wants to work here. It's never been like this. It's never been this bad. Mm -hmm. Speaker, will the Premier finally listen to health care workers like Pam and Nelson, admit Ontario's health care is on life support, and be part of the solution by investing in public health care and repealing Bill 124? Mr. Health. Thank you. You know, it's, it is exactly the uh, health care workers who we are listening to when we put forward programs like the dedicated offload nursing program to make sure that our, our community care paramedics, our paramedicine uh, experts can go in, have that dedicated offload nurse help to stabilize the patient and have that uh, paramedic turnaround. We, it is exactly why we are listening to paramedics when they say we can do things differently if you only change a few policies. And we've done that with the 911 uh, change where instead of always having to go to an emergency department, they can, with the patient's approval, take them to a long-term care home, a mental health facility, other opportunities. We are listening to the experts in the field, the experts on the front line, to make sure Response. that we provide better care. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, member for Windsor to Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Great, Minister. The sacrifice, hard work and dedication of the Ontario worker has made our province economically sound, prosperous and strong. Unfortunately, Ontario is not immune to the impacts of geopolitical instability high inflation and supply chain disruptions continue to cause to the global economy. In my communities of Windsor and Tecumseh, ongoing economic challenges are adversely affecting our business and manufacturing sectors. It is imperative that our government continue to stand in support with the Ontario worker during these uncertain times. Speaker, what is our government doing to support those whose jobs have been affected, and what programs do we have in place to assist them? 
The reply is our Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member uh, for Windsor to come see for that question and for all the work he's doing to bring the concerns of the people of Windsor to Queen's Park. Uh, Mr. Speaker, auto workers are the backbone of Windsor and Ontario's economy. These are good paying union jobs with pensions and benefits. These are jobs where you can buy a home with a two car garage, raise your family, and take your kids to hockey practice at the end of your shift. Speaker, when our automotive industry suffers, we all suffer. Last week, I joined the member for Essex in standing shoulder to shoulder with Unifor Local 444 President Dave Cassidy in Windsor. Together, we announced more than $550,000 for employment action centres to support more than 800 auto workers and their families. Speaker, we're leaving no one behind, Spons. and I'll share more in our supplemental. Back to the member for Windsor. Come see supplemental. Thank, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. The Ministry's support for our laid-off workers from Stellantis and from Syncreon was truly groundbreaking and appreciated. It is encouraging to hear that our government is standing with our workers. With roughly 13,000 jobs unfilled in our region, including Windsor and Sarnia, skilled trade jobs are in high demand and favorably looked upon. Our government must continue to show leadership in advancing the vital importance of skilled trades and manufacturing job opportunities in our province. Speaker, my question is once again to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. What is our government doing to invest in our employment services to help our highly skilled workers? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, to the member, thanks for that question. A speaker to build a stronger Ontario that works for everyone, labour, business and government must work together. That's why I was honoured to stand with our partners to announce employment action centres for their workers. Working with Unifor Local 444 and Local 195, our action centres are supporting affected workers by hosting job searching sessions, uh, organizing individually tailored career planning, providing one-to-one -one peer counselling, uh, mental health supports and supporting resume and cover letter writing. All of these services are focused on helping workers re-enter the workforce quickly. Mr. Speaker, it's this government under the leadership of Premier Ford that has the backs of our auto workers. We're helping them find new good jobs today and preparing them for better jobs and bigger paychecks tomorrow. To build Ontario, Response. Mr. Speaker, we need all hands on deck. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, the government sent a letter to directing primary care organizations to offer clinical services seven days a week, including evenings, due to high volume pressures across our health care system. But starting this Thursday, people with children will have to pay. Here's what Gail Kirk had to say. I guess. My Christmas present to my four-year-old granddaughter and my four-month-old grandson will be a $290 annual subscription to Kids Care. Grandma, who lives on CPP and OAS, will have to do the government's job of ensuring access to health care. If this is your idea of improving access, then get out of politics, she said, end of quote. What would the minister like to say to Mrs. Gail Kirk? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the uh, memo that the member opposite is referencing was actually not sent to family doctors. It was sent to organizations, and the point was to encourage them to do what so, much, so many of our family physicians, our nurse practitioners, primary care have been doing, and that is stepping up and looking after their patients. We want to make sure that everyone has access to those primary care physicians as quickly as possible. It does ultimately take some pressure off the emergency department, but I want to reinforce that this is an agreement that was reached with the Ontario Medical Association, voted upon from their members, and it will ensure that while virtual care continues, it will be appropriate. We don't want to replace in-person care with 100% virtual care. We've seen Response. that there is value in virtual care in the province of Ontario, but we also need to make sure that there is a balance to have individuals access their primary care physicians. That's what the OMA agreement has done. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
Mrs. Gilkirk is not the only one. Sarah from Nickelbell lives with a disability. She wrote to me, concerned with these changes. She writes, my kids are away at school, my parents are elderly and live in a rural area with no Wi-Fi. Nickelbell? I can't emphasize enough how much we depend on phone GP appointment. I'm really concerned my very ill parents would contract COVID at their doctor's office, and that seems unnecessary and ludicrous. Speaker, is decreasing access to telephone consultations during a time of urgent system pressures ludicrous? Or is it another proof that the minister is trying to push patients to private services where they pay out of pockets? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I will remind the member opposite that this is a three-year agreement reached with the Ontario Medical Association. And I, I really very much resent the suggestion that virtual care is appropriate in 100% of the cases. We need to make sure that that balance is there. We need to make sure that we have individuals having access to their family care physicians, their primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, all of those organizations that are providing care in our community. That work will continue. Virtual care in the province of Ontario will continue. What changes is an agreement that was reached with the Ontario Medical Association, voted on by their members and supported by their members. Historic agreement that did not have to go to arbitration, never happened under the Liberals and the NDP. Thank you, sir. Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. As we know, the Ontario Disability Support Program was not a priority for the previous Liberal government. Shame. Unfortunately, because of their inaction, the most vulnerable in our province were forced to deal with an outdated system. Ontarians that rely on this program deserve better. In our recent fall economic statement, our government has implemented a modernized approach to better address and support individuals who receive support through this program. Speaker, can the minister please update the House on how our government is transforming social assistance and what the reaction has been? To children, community and social services to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Lanark Frontenac Kingston for the, for the very good question. He's absolutely right. Our government is making a long overdue transformation of the ODSP, a program that has faced challenges for many years. Earlier this fall, we made the largest increase to ODSP rates in decades. But our work was not done there, and we knew it. That's why two weeks ago we announced the first ever annual alignment of ODSP rates to inflation. And each of these measures will make a real difference in people's lives. This year's increase in rates is putting money in the pockets of people who need it most to cover life's essentials. And tying rates to infl inflation means people can be assured that their ODSP rates will keep up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Our government's track record of supporting those who depend on social assistance is clear. In response to our recent program transformation, the CEO of Community Living Ontario, Chris Beasley, stated that these changes are a signal from the government that they are listening and that this is a definite step in the right direction. While these words are encouraging, we all know that there is more to be done to support those on social assistance. Speaker, once again, can the minister please explain what further actions our government is taking to improve the experience of people on ODSP? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for his good work. Uh, in addition to the positive changes I mentioned in my first response, I'd like to mention our government's five-fold increase to the ODSP earned income threshold. This will encourage people with a disability who want to increase their work hours to do so without losing their benefits. We've worked with municipalities to create a shared vision for a modernized ODSP, and we're also making it easier to access support with new digital tools and modern service options, including an online application form, an expansion of the My Benefits platform, and new communications channels to allow two-way digital me messaging between clients and caseworkers. Speaker, this is important work, and our government will continue to do it. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On three separate occasions just recently, Speaker, families in Scarborough Southwest had, has, have had to rely on calling 911 because their family members had to go through mental health crisis. And that is only so that they are in hopes that they might get professional support for mental health. I heard from one parent whose daughter has been waiting after immense trauma for 18 months to get mental health support. Another parent called me in tears, feeling guilty that she had no choice but to call 911 for her son. This is the terrifying reality across our province, Speaker, to get mental health support. My question is very simple. What will this government do so that families do not have to rely on 911 emergency services or wait for more than a year to get mental health support? Mm. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the impacts that the pandemic has had on the well-being of children across Ontario. And as a result of that, we have made investments and have continued to make investments. $20 million, for instance, on an across-the-board 5% increase funding to increase all core mental health supports and addiction services for children and youth. This includes $2.7 million for new hubs in Guelph, Renfrew, Timmins and Windsor. The youth wellness hubs are actually providing immediate support to children and youth so that they can have a place that's safe and culturally appropriate to go and get help. Through our Addictions Recovery Fund as well, Mr. Speaker, we've invested of $8 million to another eight hubs to continue to increase capacity for children and youth. These sites have helped over 12,000 people, children between the ages Response. of 12 and 25, with low barrier addictions and mental health supports. Mr. Speaker, we know how critical the supports are for our children and youth, and we are making investments to ensure that they have the help they need where they need it. The supplementary question. I want to thank the minister for his response, Speaker, and I appreciate the investment that they have already made, but I'm asking what will the government do, especially in areas like Scarborough? According to uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, the number of people waiting for mental health support has increased by 135 per cent, with an increase of 175 per cent in the number of people who need urgent assessment and support and may be at the risk of homelessness. CMHA has only received a total of 3.9 per cent increase in funding over the last 11 years, nowhere close to the rate of those seeking mental health support, especially in my communities and communities across this province and the level of mental health support and addictions necessary. So will this government commit today to consistent annual increases to meet the need of mental health and addiction support services across this province? Thank you very much. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again for that question. I mean, our commitment couldn't be clear. There is a minister responsible for mental health and addictions. There's a commitment of $3.8 billion, $525 million in annualized funding. And we are looking at building continuums of care, not only in the City of Toronto, but across the province of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, you know, we inherited an incredible situation when we came to government. And I have some questions that I ask myself all the time. For instance, where were the Liberals with investments of $11 million sending children with, with eating disorders to the United States rather than building continuums of care here in the province? In 2010, there was a report from the Standing Committee where there were recommendations that were made. How many of those recommendations were put into practice? Zero. Wow. And Mr. Speaker, speaking about the NDP who Bonds. stood beside them, 13% of Ontario mental health beds, 9,645 hospital beds across the province were closed oh. with them under their leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario population is projected to grow by as much as 6 million over the next two decades with the Greater Toronto Area experiencing the most significant increase. According to the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Ontario has seen over 7,200 housing starts for October. While this is a positive development, more needed needs to be done to help reach out our goal of building 1.5 million homes in the coming decade. 
Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Housing please share what our government is doing to increase housing construction in our province? Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, and I want to thank my honourable colleague, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for the question and the great work that he does on behalf of his constituents, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it's no secret, a lot is currently at stake with the global economic market. Inflation is high and food prices have skyrocketed out of control around the world. However, Speaker, when it comes to housing, we're doing everything we can to deliver on the promise that we made to Ontarians. We have taken important steps forward through legislation like Strong Mayors, More Homes, Built Faster Act, Better Municipal Govern Governance Act to get shovels in the ground faster than ever before, Mr. Speaker. And to give an example, we have removed development charges for affordable housing units and provided discounts for rental housing options. Because, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to solving the housing crisis that we believe every single Ontarian deserves to have a home to call. Great answer. Great answer. Great question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the Associate Minister for the answer. It's great to hear how our government is taking decisive action by removing unnecessary barriers and excessive rate tape that is delaying further housing construction. While the leadership we have shown is encouraging, the people of my riding are concerned about their ability to own a home in their local communities and neighborhoods. They want to see all levels of governments working together to address this issue. Speaker, once again to the Associate Minister of Housing, how is our government providing immediate support for Ontarians looking for a new home? Good question. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I thank my uh, colleague for, for the question. The short answer, Mr. Speaker, is yes. yes. We are in a housing crisis, so we have to look at existing homes and structures that we can provide more relief to Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is expected to grow by more than 2 million people by 2031. So all options are on the table, Mr. Speaker, that will add, help us add more existing housing supply, Speaker. We are already looking at options by introducing as-of-right zoning. Ontarians are now able to create and rent up to three units in their existing home. This will not only add to our provincial housing supply, but will also help pay for the high interest rates Ontarians and others around the world are forced to pay. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to look for other solutions that will help us add more homes to the market and help us build 1.5 million homes across the province, Mr. Speaker, as we said it time and time again, letting Ontarians down on this side and in the middle there is not an option, Mr. Speaker. Member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, health care workers are urging MPPs to support my bill, the Stay Home If You Are Sick Act, to give Ontario workers 10 permanent paid sick days. This government's temporary three COVID-related days to last over a pandemic that will soon be entering its third year are doing nothing to address the health care crisis that is overwhelming our pediatric hospitals. What would help are 10 permanent paid sick days to enable low-wage workers to stay home if their child is ill, perhaps with RSV, without losing their paycheck. Speaker, will this government listen to advice from health care workers and vote to pass my bill today? Minister of Long-Term Care and Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, I, look, the honourable member knows that uh, uh, private members I've never been accused of not being able to be heard before. That's a, that's a, that's a first. So uh, uh, the member knows that, of course, members are free to uh, decide on any of the private members' bills. Uh, and after question period, I'm sure members will make the decision on the on the bill put forward by the opposition house leader. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, as you will know, uh, this government was one of the first governments in the entire country to protect jobs, uh, 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 workers' jobs during uh, during COVID. We also. Uh, uh, thanks to the Premier, uh, brought in a, a, a billion-dollar program to ensure that uh, workers who were impacted during COVID were, uh, were protected and had a nationwide leading sick day program at the same time, Mr. Speaker. So we're very proud of the record, and it is one of the reasons that we did so well during COVID, uh, uh, Speaker. The people of the province of Ontario ensured that we got through this uh, together and we'll continue to work with them and with all of those uh, frontline heroes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much. Supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier, this government's record is nothing to be proud of. They cut the two paid sick days that workers had in Ontario. Ontario is now falling behind other jurisdictions that are implementing permanent paid sick days. British Columbia has legislated five paid sick days. Federally regulated workers will soon have access to 10 paid sick days. Governments are doing this because they know that permanent paid sick days are good for workers, good for the economy, and good for public health. Speaker, this government could finally show that working for workers is more than just an empty slogan by passing my bill to legislate 10 paid sick days. Will this government do that? Again, the government house speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, this is a government that led the way in, in terms of protecting workers during, uh, during the pandemic. Of course, we still do have uh, uh, paid sick days. Uh, speaker, we were, the, of course, the Premier was the one who led the, the Federation, ensuring that the federal government participated in our, uh, our nationwide leading sick day program. But you know what else is good for workers, Speaker, is jobs. Jobs is, is, are good for workers, and that is why the investments that this government is making, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing later on today has a bill that we will be voting on, which will bring over 1.5 million homes uh, to the people of the province of Ontario. That includes good jobs for people who will be building those 1.5 uh, million homes. But if you look at what the economy has been able to do, even despite COVID, Speaker, we are needing the nation in terms of job creation. We've brought back all of those jobs that the Liberals lost in their time and offers over 300,000. Response. We have 300,000 jobs that need to be filled. So jobs are good for workers, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to fight for those workers each and every day. That concludes our question period for this morning. The Minister of Red Tape Production has informed me that he has a point of order, and I recognize him. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to take a moment uh, and introduce Donna Donnelly, our school trustee for Ward 1 and 2 from Milton. Welcome to the Legislature. Thank you for your leadership. For Brampton West, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would li also like to take this opportunity to welcome Kathy McDonald, school trustee from Wards 3 and 4, Brampton. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 23, an act to amend various statutes to revoke various regulations and enact the Supporting Growth and Housing in York and Durham Regions Act 2022. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.